Hi everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining Foley and Lardner for today's presentation. Before we get started on today's program, I would like to briefly go over a few housekeeping items. If you are not speaking, kindly mute your microphone. Um, if you have any questions about any of today's topics, please enter them in the meeting chat or raise your hand by clicking the hand icon located in the toolbar on the top right hand side of your screen. If you experience any technical difficulties, please refresh your browser or leave the meeting and rejoin. If you continue to have issues, please email videoconferencing at foley.com. Also, please note that today's presentation is being recorded. Additionally, um, Foley will be applying for CLE credit for this program. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to type the code when it is announced into the meeting chat feature on your screen. If you do not supply your CLE information upon registration, please email it to cwallacecooper at foley.com. Certificates of attendance will be distributed via email to eligible participants in approximately eight weeks. Um, please note that those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form in addition to answering the question. Please email the form, which is located in the meeting chat, to cwallacecooper at foley.com immediately following the program. And now I will turn it over to our presenters to begin today's program. Thanks, Shannon. Welcome everyone and thanks for attending today's NIL program. I'm Kevin Schultz, co-chair of Foley Sports and Entertainment Group. I'm a partner in our transactions practice, working with pro sports teams, universities, and sponsors, among others. I'm also a member of Foley's NIL task force. We formed this multidisciplinary task force in response to the groundbreaking changes in college sports and the newfound freedom of student athletes to commercialize and sell rights to their name, image, and likeness. Our attorneys are, our attorneys are well positioned to advise various stakeholders related to their NIL issues, including sponsors, commercial entities and brands, colleges and universities, athletic conferences, both college and high school, sports agents, and, student, and the student athletes themselves. As we'll discuss more in the program, the NIL regulatory landscape currently presents a complex patchwork of state NIL laws and NCAA rules, which create not only new business opportunities, but also significant legal implications for those engaging in NIL activities. Understanding that landscape is critical to both leveraging opportunity and reducing risk. Foley's multi disciplinary team is already advising clients on NIL matters and is uniquely positioned to help all stakeholders navigating the regulatory labyrinth and the many legal concerns that may arise in the NIL space, including in areas such as contracts, licensing, intellectual property, technology and data privacy, social media, digital platforms and non-fungible tokens, NFTs, media rights, academic and athletic eligibility, NCAA compliance, financial reporting, and tax and estate planning. Just uh, our representative experience includes advising a five-star football recruit on state law and restrictions for high school athletes, advising player agencies on NIL-related limitations and licensing requirements, and advising a consortium of sporting goods and apparel manufacturers on NIL regulations and sponsorship opportunities. Our NIL task force is also actively producing cutting edge pieces and updates on the evolving NIL landscape, including our NIL tracker that we'll be discussing later in the program. I will now turn things over to my partner, Byron McLean, to kick off the discussion. Byron? Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are located. Uh, my name is Byron McLean. I am a partner in Foley and Lardner's Los Angeles office. I'm also a member of the Government Enforcement, Defense and Investigations uh, Practice Group and a member of the Sports and Entertainment Industry Team. I have the honor today of moderating the first part of our discussion, which is going to basically be Foley's legal take on NIL and the shifting legal landscape of college sports. We have three panelists um, who are going to be addressing this issue. Um, they are John Israel, Greg Marino, and Andy Lee, and I will now give them an opportunity to briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. So, uh, John, I'll turn it over to you first. Just making sure I'm not on mute here. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Byron, and I want to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is John Israel. I'm a uh, partner in our Foley's New York office, uh, a labor and employment lawyer by training. 
Um, so the college sports landscape has elements of that which intrigue me in addition to NIL, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I am co-chair of the Sports and Entertainment Group along with Kevin, uh, and we're excited to have you all here and excited to have this conversation on this rapidly developing new commercial opportunity in the college sports landscape. Andy? Or Andy? Or Greg, one of you. Yeah. Uh, I'll jump in quick. Uh, my name's Andy Lee. Uh, I'm also here in uh, Foley's New York office, part of the sports and entertainment group, along with uh, John, Kevin, and Greg, and the rest of us. Uh, I've been practicing in this area pretty much my whole career, uh, back to even before uh, this, but I was the general counsel at the New York Jets, uh, general counsel for the New York, New Jersey Super Bowl host committee, and I had my own practice for about 10 years before merging it into Foley's sports group. Uh, much of Much of my work in the sports uh, sponsorship and endorsement um, uh, world, both for you know teams and leagues, brands and agencies, and for players. So, um, I have a pretty broad uh, perspective on this, and it's, it's definitely been a big deal to to open up this new market. So, I look forward to talking more about it. Greg, hi everyone. Greg Marino. I'm also in the New York office uh, and part of the sports and entertainment group, and specifically uh, this task force. Uh, like Andy, uh, I've been a sports lawyer uh, my entire career, uh, and my career started at Foley uh, a little over a year and a half ago when I came over with Andy from that boutique sports and entertainment uh, law firm that, that he had founded. Um, so a lot of our work is litigation, but a lot of it is transactional as well, and specifically in this space, that, that's where I see a lot of our work going. But uh, yeah, all, all the major stakeholders uh, we've, we've been working with from sponsors to athletes themselves, and this is certainly an exciting part of the law, an exciting part the law for me so excited that you guys all came out spent a little time with us on it awesome and uh right before we begin i'll just note for everyone that if uh this portion of the program will go until about uh i guess 10 45 on the west coast uh 145 on the east coast if you have any questions please put them in the chat and we'll try to address those during the you know in about 30 35 minutes um with these panelists if you have any questions specifically for them but without further ado i'll uh ask john the first question and basically just ask, you know, why is this webinar important on in, on the NIL and the shifting legal landscape of college sports and what's going on in this area? Well, you know, clearly there's been some dramatic change. And I would say after, you know, years of pressure, both on the litigation front and then with legislative change um, in, in creating or attacking or approaching the rights of college athletes, um, certainly to earn money or commercialize their name, image, and likeness. And really with a confluence of events over this past summer, we had the Alston decision, we had state NIL laws going into effect, and then the NCAA's response to this, um, you know, the dam broke and uh, the landscape really has changed dramatically. Um, as everybody's mentioned already, there's lots of stakeholders in this space who have interests um, in the rapidly changing environment. Um, which is, you know, really why we're here. And we thought the timing was good because we're about four months into this, right? With the, you know, football season, college football season, um, you know, going strong and the basketball season really about to get underway. So we thought it'd be a good opportunity to take a look at, at what has happened, why it's happening, um, and just, you know, have that discussion at this important time. Sounds good. So, and, and Greg, I mean, John mentioned, you know, the Alston case, and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that in, in a second. But uh, Greg, if you could kind of just give us um, the general legal backdrop and maybe, you know, a simple overview of kind of the basics and history of NIL laws, starting first by what does NIL even mean? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's certainly a, a threshold question. NIL uh, stands for name, image, and likeness, as I'm sure most of us know by now. And in the context that we're discussing today, we're really talking about student athletes, mostly college athletes, but high school as well, um, being able to enter into third party endorsement and licensing deals for cash or other forms of uh, compensation. So this is something that most of us take for granted, our ability to commercially benefit from our names, uh, not that anyone would want to endorse us for anything, but that hasn't been a reality for college athletes for 
about 115 years. And that's when the NCAA was founded. And really since that point, it had outlawed student athlete payment through a variety of bylaws on amateurism, uh, specifically bylaw 12, which covers amateurism and eligibility. And that included, included NIL really heretofore. So really to put it simply, until the end of June, 2021, this summer, any college athlete that was selling or licensing his or her NIL to a third party was risking serious discipline for themselves and for their schools. And we've seen this a number of times over the years with all sorts of NCAA scandals. So Greg, you mentioned, you know, over the last 115 years that the NCAA had a prohibition against, you know, um, athletes being able to use their name, image and likenesses. During the course of this period, when did the dam begin to break? Like which really started, you know, to cause things to crack in this area? Well, I, I would say the cracks were really formed by two major forces, um, one being antitrust litigation, uh, most notably in the O'Bannon and Austin decisions that we're going to get to um, in a little bit, and the other being legislative action on the state level, which we'll also cover. So litigation really got this ball rolling, um, and, and the first big shoe to drop was the O'Bannon versus NCA decision uh, in 2014, 2015. You could argue you could go back to the NCA Board of Regents case as well, but we'll try to stay current and on time uh, here. So O'Bannon was an antitrust lawsuit um, filed as a class action against the NCAA, the Collegiate Licensing Company, and Electronic Arts, the video game manufacturer, in 2009. And the crux of that action was the use of college athlete NIL through their depictions in EOS, EA Sports video games that we've all played and enjoyed uh, over the course of our lives and, and the NCAA amateurism rules that prohibited payments to those athletes for that use, whether those rules constituted an illegal restraint of trade under the Sherman Antitrust Act. So 2014, Northern District of California District Court rules for the O'Bannon class um, and basically says that the NCAA bylaws are subject to antitrust rule of reason scrutiny um, and that they had a significant anti-competitive effect. 2015, U.S. Court of Appeals Ninth Court uh, Ninth Circuit rather, um, upholds much of that decision, uh, specifically that the NCAA amateurism rules have been more restrictive than necessary to support the tradition of amateurism um, and that the rule of reason analysis was going to determine the legitimacy of all those rules moving forward. So fast forward, we have other class action lawsuits filed against the NCAA and colleges springing up, um, you know, including caps on educational funds we're going to talk about with Alston. Um, but O'Bannon really opened the door to state governments uh, to start challenging the NCAA on the legislative side. So that's the other big point. And after O'Bannon, we see states begin to uh, kind of take notice and float NIL policies that were unthinkable pre-O'Bannon, and not just from a legal perspective, but a cultural one. NIL became kind of okay culturally, and that's across blue states, red states, all over, we saw kind of this rush to pass these laws, and that really started um, in California in 2019. So Fair Pay to Play Act, uh, Governor Newsom signs in uh, <laughs> on LeBron James's HBO show in 2019. Um, and soon after that, we have other states kind of dipping their toe in the water. And, and that California law was set to take effect in 2023 at the time, but it set the state on kind of a slow motion collision course with those NCAA bylaws. Um, and that California law prohibited state colleges, conferences, or the NCAA from um, restricting NIL. And then we just see a deluge following after that. So between 2019, 2021, we have nearly 30 states uh, kind of doing the same thing. Um, and it just sets up this major conflict that was, was um, set to take place on July 1st when someone became effective. Got it. And well, Greg, thank you for that background. And, and I'd be remiss if, uh, if I didn't mention being in Los Angeles that the O'Bannon that you referenced is the Ed O'Bannon of the national champion UCLA Bruins in 1995. So uh, just to give context to that. Um, moving to uh, uh, the most recent uh, Supreme Court case, the Alston case. Um, John, if you could give us a little bit of background on the Alston decision and how that all fits into this legal landscape. Uh, well, look, as Greg as Greg mentioned, I mean, Austin, the decision that came down over the summer, you know, had many years in the making. And that case started, you know, uh, you know, a number of years ago, uh, dating back to the O'Bannon decision. And and it's not an NIL case as and a lot of ink has already been spilled about Alston over the last several months. So, you know, how much time we take here today. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try to move through it, but, uh, you know, this started, you know, many, many years ago, 
the case and related cases, the Jenkins, they predate the state NIL laws. They were following O'Bannon's footsteps. And, you know, really the initial ma- the initial approach to uh, the Alston case was a proposal that a free market without limits on what schools could offer in terms of uh, compensation and scholarships was really, you know, pretty, uh, pretty incredible uh, and an incredible approach and some off suggesting some dramatic change. And the district court early on rejected the challenge to the rules that that would, you know, limit scholarships to full cost of attendance and that restrict compensation and benefits, which is why ultimately at the end of the day, when the Supreme Court issues its decision, um, we're focused on, you know, educational benefits um, and there was some acceptance, at least a number of years ago, by the district court in terms of what the, the Supreme Court was reviewing, that there was some price fixing involved, but it was reasonable. So as not to, you know, blur the line between college and professional sports. And that's how the Alston case sort of grew up into a Supreme Court decision. The NCAA took some losses along the way, obviously. You know, they took their appeal. Um to the Supreme Court, mostly on their concept of amateurism. They, you know, they put it out there, put it on the line with the Supreme Court. Um, and we got this decision up, upholding the, the the lower court's decisions that that struck down caps on, you know, uh, student athlete, athlete academic benefits on, on anti federal antitrust grounds. And, you know, significantly a game, game changer on a number of for a number of reasons, one being the idea that this amateurism built on the Board of Regents case that is has in basically been part of um, most of the NCAA's argument, arguments on every front seem to be undercut by the Supreme Court. Um, and then while the case is not about NIL specifically, um, it really signaled a shot across the bow here that, and especially with Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence, um, that, you know, that the Supreme Court was skeptical about the legality of potentially any uh, restriction on uh, NCAA benefits, whether it's in compensation and wages, et cetera. So really opening the door potentially to future litigation um, on a variety of fronts. And so, uh, Greg, I'll, I'll turn to you on this one. So John referenced how the Austin case, you know, dealt with, you know, educational and academic benefits. But what happened after Austin? Um, uh, after that case was decided. Yeah, well, Byron, I'm, I'm I'm kind of inclined to view O'Bannon and Alston as canaries in the coal mine on NIL, even though Alston did not specifically speak to them, and even though Alston actually <laughs> was decided after a lot of these NIL laws were written. But I, I say that because they combined with the state NIL laws to kind of put the NCAA on the defensive and to and to force them to make choices and and functionally. Um, with all, a lot of these laws, over a dozen of them set to become effective on July 1st of last of this year, we were left. The NCA was really left with three choices. They could rush to file injunctions in every state that had passed an NIL law, and they'd be making the same kind of pro-competitive amateurism arguments that had already failed in O'Bannon and now at the Supreme Court in Alston. So not great. Um, they could amend their amateurism bylaws to allow NIL compensation. Spoiler alert, they do do that. Um, or, or three, they could kind of ask the federal government to swoop in with a favorable bill that would preempt all of those NIL state laws and maybe throw in some federal antitrust exemption for a good measure. So that was kind of the pie in the sky ask. But, you know, good rule of thumb if you're waiting on bipartisan federal action to solve your problems, don't do that. So uh, no federal law was passed July 1st. Um, so the NCAA falls back to option two. They amend their bylaws on an interim basis, um, and that's they they do that on June thirtieth of uh, twenty twenty one. So just one day before a lot of those state NIL laws were were set to take force, and uh, these interim policies basically are waiving compliance with Article twelve of the NCA bylaws. Um, so the the policy, which is really the one that's still in force right now, allows student athletes to engage in NIL activities that are consistent with their state laws. If this, if their states do have those laws. In non-NIL states, they can still engage in NIL without violating NCAA rules. Um, also allows individuals to hire agents for the purpose of NIL. 
pay for play is still out and still illegal, but basically the NCAA took the path of least resistance and, and changed their bylaws right before the end date. So in fact, Greg, you referenced um, the different state NIL laws, and I know that you manage the project for Foley dealing, you know, kind of putting on our website the different NIL laws across different states. Can you describe some of the basics of state NIL laws, whether it be their similarities, their differences, kind of the patchwork that was created? Yeah, I think I think patchwork is probably the right word to describe what we currently have, but it's also important to understand that most of these state NIL laws have the same basic provisions. Um, so the, the the differences are important, but the, the the commonalities are as well. So mostly they're allowing athletes to license their NIL without risking their college eligibility. That's obvious. Mostly they're prohibiting payment for athletic performance, aka pay for play, or for attending a certain school. That's still all out. Um, it allows athletes to hire representatives to assist them with NIL. Um, generally, they require disclosure of their NIL agreements to schools, some not all, and, and there are different methods of doing that um, from state to state. Um, generally, they're prohibiting agreements that conflict with school or team contracts um, or allow schools to prohibit them. That, that's a conflict we'll get to uh, in a little more depth as well. So you're going to see a lot of those same elements across the NIL universe, but those elements can also be stated in different ways um, that, that can be important. For example, the very right of NIL commercialization is sometimes stated as a positive right, as a guarantee for student athletes. Other times it's written as a negative prohibition for colleges or even for the NCAA within a state. So there's a distinction there. Um, another example, some laws per, in certain state laws prohibit conflicts with college contracts. Others allow colleges to prohibit contracts that conflict with college contracts. Um, doesn't seem to be a huge difference, but but it can be. Um, and then there there are substantive differences as well. So um, fair market caps, that's something that certain state laws have. These are provisions that kind of require NIL deals to be to reflect the fair market value and to kind of discourage outsized payments for no show NIL jobs. But you know we can see that this is a very subjective uh, uh, element, and you know no one on this call, I'm sure, can define the fair market value of a 19 year old tweeting about your car dealership. So, you know, we, we have those differences, but they could be important. We'll see how, how the, the market decides and they could have a potential chilling effect on some NIL deals. Um, other rules, booster prohibitions, um, you know, the role of boosters in NIL, like the role of boosters inherently is kind of a gray area. And, um, you know, there's a question as how boosters uh, fall into this process. The NCAA rules themselves don't prohibit boosters uh, from being involved in NIL deals, uh, but certain states actually do have anti-booster provisions in them, um, and some others are totally silent on it. So it's unclear how those are gonna wind up being enforced, if at all. We're already seeing a lot of boostery activity in states that have anti-booster <laughs> provisions. So um, we'll, we'll, again, see how it actually shakes out in the market. Um, other things, uh, athletes, uh, that have not yet attended college. So high schoolers, recruits, um, that's another big question. Most state laws don't actually distinguish between high school athletes and college athletes for the purpose of NIL, um, but others do. And in a world where, you know, top recruits are routinely Instagram celebrities by the age of 16, um, that matters. Um, you know, and Texas is one of those states that prohibits high school NIL. Biggest state in the union, a lot of great athletes coming from there. So, so that certainly matters. Um, disclosure requirements, I, I talked about that before. Most states do have them. Um, Arizona, for example, does not, but the way that they're enforced can be different. Um, and then just weird wrinkles, uh, like pooling options uh, in Georgia's bill, which would allow schools to force student athletes to put 75% of their NIL into an escrow account for pro rata sharing. Um, agent status, uh, certain state laws uh, require uh, agents to be licensed attorneys or to follow some other sort of state registration. Other states don't have anything like that. So, I mean, there are differences um, and, you know, understanding those uh, is is certainly paramount if you're going to enter this market broadly. And I know, I mean, we could have an entire session on the different NIL state laws, but what we'll do is during the course of this session at some point, we'll put a link to the Foley's interactive map that kind of identifies the different state laws that you kind of, you put together, Greg, with your, uh, with the Foley team. We'll put that in the chat. Um, but I want to turn it over to Andy right now. So we've so Andy, we've heard from John and Greg talk about, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of NILs, the legal perspective of the different laws that are coming out. But practically from a from a corporate, from a business perspective, um, what's happened after July 1st uh, in that regard? Uh, <clears throat> sure. Uh, well, I, I think 
you know, what happened after July 1st actually started before July 1st. We had, you know, everyone knew this was coming uh, and these laws were going into effect. So you saw uh, athletes and agents and brands uh, gearing up and getting ready to hit the ground running at 12.01 a.m. Uh, on July 1st. And there was some, you know, there was a lot of press coverage about this, including some some high profile uh, college athletes, uh, a lot of quarterbacks, as you know, wouldn't be, which wouldn't be such a surprise. Like Bryce Young from Alabama uh, did a deal. He actually signed with with uh, CAA as his his agency for endorsement, you know, endorsement deals, not for professional playing. Of course, um, he, he announced a big deal with the Cash App. Uh, Bo Nix from the Auburn quarterback did a deal with Milo Sweet Tea. Um, Miles Brennan, the quarterback from LSU. Had announced a deal with Smoothie King and Quinn Ewers, who was a high school, you know, like top-rated high school uh, quarterback, wound up doing a, announced a seven-figure autograph deal with with GT Sports, um, and actually very publicly skipped his senior year of high school to go, you know, enroll at school uh, because of the Texas state law and the way the way it was structured. Um, we're also seeing uh, developments in in the market. Uh, in terms of the ecosystem for, for this market uh, uh, start to build out. So you have uh, uh, group licensing issues where players are joining together uh, to, to license their, their NIL rights together uh, as a way, sometimes that's a way to be able to do it with the, the university logos. Uh, in, in, many, in most instances, an athlete, uh, whether it's college, even at the pro level, doesn't have the right to use his team's uh, Someone, Someone needs to get some feedback. Um, his team's logo and uniform and color. So by there may be opportunities where the schools have programs uh, that allow uh, players to come together to do that. Uh, there are also platforms that are um, uh, encouraging that. Um, uh, and some of them, you know, we have one of our guest speakers uh, is, is part of a platform that helps to facilitate these deals. But there's there's other uh, platforms like like Brander that has done deals with schools uh, to try to help the players and the athletes from those schools connect with sponsors and do things in a way that that streamlines and simplifies the process. Um, there, there are others like Matchpoint and Dream, Dream Fields as well. Um, of course, athletes could choose to go and try to do this all on their own, but there's a lot of there's a lot of work that goes into it. So there's a space now in this market for companies like that to, to step in and be sort of uh, matchmakers. Uh, with the athletes. Um, we're also seeing uh, NIL collectives, which are sort of clearinghouses for fans, boosters, and sponsors to come together to try to pay athletes for NIL services. Um, we see these in uh, Florida. There's a Florida Gator Collective made up of, of University of Florida fans. There's something called Hoosier Hysterics, which is um, Indiana fans. Um, so it, it, there's some risk there. It's a potential end run around booster restrictions, but it also is a legitimate way for sort of a, a community based exploitation of these rights. So I think we're going to. And so it's only been four months, right? And we're already seeing a lot of innovation. Many of these platforms have apps to make it easy, you know, for for people or for the players um, to get involved with these things. So I think we're going to see a lot more innovation as more money starts flowing. We'll see more innovation and things will develop in a bigger way. Got it. And Andy, you know, you and, and, and Greg and John have all mentioned some of the different uh, stakeholders that have kind of been impacted by the, the NIL landscape change. I'd like to go through each of those separately and kind of have us address each one and how they've been impacted, where the opportunities are and, and the risks are. So, Greg, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. If you could focus on the schools themselves and then maybe even lead into the conferences, how have they been in, impacted by this changing NIL landscape? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, schools, of course, um, are now undertaking a, a totally new role. Um, they've they've always had a, you know a lot of compliance requirements, but this goes a little further, right? Um, now we're talking about third party uh, compliance, um, and it adds a, just a vast new layer of complexity. Um, schools are also want to protect their IP and uh, their IP rights. Those are very, very important, very, very valuable. Um, but at the same time, they're not wanting to alienate their their athletes. And, uh, and I'm sure some of our guests later in the show are going to be able to speak to this um, firsthand. Um, conferences, there will be a big question as to to what extent as the NCAA, um, as this monolith starts to break into smaller pieces, what, what is going to be the regulatory role for conferences? Certainly, the Austin decision kind of gave a, a, a broader 
uh, view towards conference uh, regulatory uh, efforts than they would for the NCAA. Uh, we've seen some smaller conferences come out with their own NIL uh, rules, the Ivy League, the Colonial Athletic Association. Um, so, so those, you know, those, those big um, uh, administrative elements of the college sports landscape are now dealing with this and taking on something that requires significant bandwidth and for them to jump into something um, that in a lot of ways and cases, they could find themselves to be adverse parties in. Um, well, you know, lit litigation, of course, could stem from any of these, uh, any of these laws or any of these um, deals that do or do not come through. Got it. And Andy, what about uh, as far as, you know, the the pros and cons uh, impacting athletes or the sponsors or the player agents? Can you speak <clears throat> on that briefly? Uh, sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's very interesting. I think it's going to it's going to particularly for the athletes, it's going to be an adjustment and uh, a change of of life. I mean, we do have you have the high profile athletes who are getting the big deals that we're seeing, you know, press coverage about. But let's not forget that there are a lot of other, you know, players out there who may or may not have a future in, in professional sports, right? They're out there, they're competing for it. They're in college in a lot of instances, they're still, they may even still be teenagers. Um, there's a market for, for them as well. You know, you don't have to be uh, doing a million dollar or a hundred or six, even a six figure uh, NIL deal for it to be meaningful uh, for, for a kid in college you know, an extra five hundred or thousand dollars a month might might make a big difference. And for a local sponsor, um, the attention that a, that an athlete like that could bring might actually be you know be meaningful and important to, to their business and to their to their consumer base on the local local level. So, um, and you know, a lot of these kids already have followings. They have social media followings, and they have the audience built in. And they've been precluded from from doing with those audiences what what other kids their age who might not be athletes uh, are able to do um they, they do one thing i do want to mention is that the athletes and for anyone who's in this space should remind the athletes about this because keeping in mind their kids um you if they if they're doing this online and social media there are ftc federal trade commission rules about disclosure where posts that are paid for by a brand about a product you have to disclose that it's a paid advertisement so that's a, a legal issue that um uh, they, they need to keep their eyes on. Um, that's something that that sponsors and frankly agents as well should remain educated about because it should be called out in the agreements that they do with these kids to make sure that it's clear to them uh, that that those restrictions apply to them. Um, <clears throat> well, Nikki, I'll say too, I mean, you referenced them as, as kids. Uh, we talk a lot about, you know, them as college athletes, but I imagine this have huge implications on high school sports and the regulatory bodies and associations that govern those as well, right? Absolutely. Um, it's as Greg said earlier. This it's been a hundred years of of resistance to to this type of concept, but you know the the world has changed now. We know a lot of high school kids are out there making real money on YouTube or or Instagram, having nothing to do with sports. Um, so there's 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 a reality there that that needs to be recognized. Now the the high school associations where it's dependent what, what the way this applies in, in high school situations is really going to vary by state to state because in some instances the nil laws are really geared towards colleges um and and uh, are precluding how things can be treated on, on the high school level uh, uh the, and there's also differences in turn among states in terms of what agents can and can't do right so agents sometimes have licensing requirements to be to be recruiting um, you know, players, depending on what state you're going into. And there's also a difference between representing the, the players for NIL specific endorsement type deals and representing players in terms of trying to sign professional contracts after college. So there, there are a lot of regulatory issues there that, that need to be kept up with. But I will say this, it's a, it's a, it's a new field for the agents. And I've spoken to a lot of them who, who have dug into this because it's a way this to- this or whatever, like- uh, way that was included as a protected class. So it someone might need to. Uh, so it's a way to, um, you know, for agents to not only help these kids, you know, the college kids get a little extra spending money, but to build relationships with them and to build trust, so that when it comes time, if they're in a position to make it into, into the pro league or to compete for that spot, they already have a relationship. They know the the agent. Um, and so it's accelerated that process, which is an important part of, of of the sports business world, right? Those relationships. Agents spend a lot of time getting to know young players and their families. And there's a there's a whole competitive landscape that happens right. here of trying to gain that trust. So it's right. now 
been accelerated. And John, if you could comment on one of the biggest stakeholders, obviously, that we see in the news all the time is the NCAA. I think they just recently had an article come out yesterday about how they're changing their constitution. Can you talk about the NCAA and how it's impacted them and what, what we can expect from them? Well, yeah, well, I mean, clearly, as Greg mentioned, they stepped back and this created this whole, you know, commercial opportunity in a new market. Um, it's unclear what their end game ultimately is. I mean, they were an organization that was fighting on every front on the litigation side on antitrust. Um, they were lobbying against, you know, state NIL laws and now, you know, but on the same hand, <laughs> lobbying for preemptive federal laws. Um, whether this interim policy will become a long-term policy, I guess is, is an open question, but maybe yesterday they just answered it a little bit because the constitution as proposed seems to suggest that you know, NIL is here to stay as far as the NCAA is concerned. And it's clearly taking its prompts from the Supreme Court decision in, you know, sort of pushing down regulatory authority from, you know, the ultimate NCAA uh, position to the conferences and the schools themselves, which seems to align at least with the, in, the instructive um, uh, rationales coming from the courts here that, 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 that would, that would, potentially avoid, you know, antitrust considerations. So does it, you know, does it still see itself with the broader regulatory role? I don't know. Uh, but I think maybe we're seeing, you know, a, a dispersion of that from their perspective down to the conferences and schools. So John, one question I do want to ask you to follow up on that. I know we only have about five more minutes left in, in this portion of the program, but, you know, obviously, you know, the NIL impact is the first domino to fall. Where else could there be an impact? Well, look, you know, the Austin case, you know, has opened the door or resurrected a, a number of other potential legal considerations when it comes to college student rights. As we say, you know, we still have the litigation to deal with. And, and you know, we just, you know, there's an NIL litigation that's been going on for some time. Uh, the House case, uh, which is, you know, a direct attack on uh, the the. NCAA's prohibition against NIL compensation. Now, of course, lots of things have changed since that case started, and the NCAA and the Power Five conferences, who were uh, who are defendants in that case, lost a motion to dismiss. The case was just reset with a new amended complaint. Uh, but you know, the world is changing dramatically, and there's two things. One is, as I said before, the the undercutting of the NCAA's position on amateurism uh, is at the heart of these changes. And, you know, we also on the labor and employment front, which particularly interests me as a labor and employment lawyer, you know, we saw the, the NLRB's general counsel uh, issue a memorandum um, on, you know, bargaining rights uh, and treatment of, of college athletes as employees uh, under the NLRA. And that is not something that's new technically because we saw it with the Northwestern case and not enough time here today to go into it, but certainly a big change, potentially, uh, you know, uh, not definitive and it's just an agency policy, but you know, it is a, it is a, an, an important policy position out there that is getting people to take notice. Uh, you know, and we've got the wage hour litigations that have been going on for years. Once we look back and, and saw the Northwestern case where uh, college athletes or football players were deemed employees under the NLRA at the regional level, we saw all sorts of, you know, wage hour litigation uh, seeking to extend that concept to other employment laws. Whether or not this employment concept is the future. Uh, I'm skeptical on that front. Others have heard me talk about this before. I'm not sure it's the best uh, vehicle for, for you know, even if you believe that, that, that college athletes are deserving of more protection. I'm not sure that's the right vehicle, but a legislative solution ultimately is probably where this all heads, uh, whether it's on the employment front or even on the NIL front, to the extent, you know, anyone believes there's got to be uniformity uh, you know, and regulation. Uh, and at this point, it's not clear to me where that regulation is coming from to the extent any of these NIL deals, um, you know, cross the line into uh, uh, potential pay for play concepts. Well, and before I give each of you an opportunity to kind of give some closing thoughts, I saw that we had two questions in the in the chat room. Um, if any of you want to answer them, one of them is, do you believe the district court judge in Alston 
would have allowed the plaintiff's original challenge, open market, to proceed if not for the O'Bannon appellate decision that prevented, quote, payments untethered to education. You want to take that one? And I, I will note the district court judge was the same uh, in the Austin and O'Bannon cases in Northern District of California. But anyone want to take that one or have any thoughts? Well, look, I think it's an interesting question. And the, the same judge is, is the judge in the House case that I mentioned before. Uh, and watching her approach um, to this case, you know, will be interesting because, you know, clearly, you know, she recognized that there is some merit to um, the concept of the college sports or at least college football or basketball product that merits some distinction uh, from professional sports. Uh, and I think even the Austin case ultimately uh, bears that out in terms of how the Supreme Court tried to cabinet uh, in, in around educational benefits in a way that suggests that there was room for, and the, 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 the majority opinion clearly suggests that there was many, much, much room for the NCAA to um, preserve its position um, uh, around its product of college sports. And I think, Greg, you might have actually answered the second question when you were presenting, but do you foresee any new potential litigation exposure for colleges and universities as a result of Alston or the NCAA waiver of enforcement of NIL bylaws? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question and, and, and something actually um, we, we might even get into in, in part two. But I, I think the, the next big step here or, or the next big questions are going to be um, college's roles in kind of acting as the clearinghouse for a, a lot of these agreements um, and being able to give a thumbs up or thumbs down on uh, at potential NIL agreements that athletes want to enter into and whether or not those conflict with either school rules or school sponsors or team rules. A lot of these state laws are, are written kind of broadly, which really gives the schools a, a, a broad, broad um, uh, ability to kind of determine whether or not um, student athletes are able to enter into certain deals. And, and that goes beyond even the certain categories that are off limits on a, under a lot of state um, state NIL laws. So we're talking about the typical vice industries, you know, adult entertainment, alcohol, but also gambling. And, you know, everyone on this call knows that gaming and gambling is a huge revenue generator um, in our space right now, especially from an endorsement standpoint. And the extent to which, you know, high school and college athletes are going to be prevented from getting in on any of those deals based on some arbitrary, you know, st either state, I guess not so arbitrary, but college rule or team rule that could have a real chilling effect um, on an athlete's ability to uh, engage in NIL. And I, I could certainly see some sort of uh, litigation uh, emerging or erupting uh, right there because the, the colleges are, are really in a in a kind of an odd position. Uh, All right, so. So very quickly, uh, just to give you an opportunity to give some final thoughts just on, you know, how conferences, colleges and athletes should be protecting their respective financial interests in this new and evolving world of student athlete compensation. And why don't we start with Andy, then we'll go to Greg and then we'll uh, let John finish out. Thanks, Byron. Um, yeah, I, I think one thing I think is really um, important in this space is and I think it's going to be the benefit of everyone financially and otherwise uh, is to make sure that the athletes getting involved in this are not just getting money, but they're also getting resources. They're getting financial education, um, you know, we, especially as they start making more money. We see it in the, with pro athletes all the time. All of a sudden, there's the entourage and every third cousin is coming forward and everyone is so close with them. And they start buying people houses and cars and they think this money's going to last forever when their professional career might only be three or five years. Um, I think that's it. I, I want to make sure that I, I would stress to, to athletes, to agents, to sponsors, to brands to to really in everything you do in this space, you know, put an emphasis on that. Make sure they understand that maybe even, you know, let's find some like charity or something to to contribute part of the proceeds to because it will it will benefit the overall economy of NIL if if there's integrity in it in that sense. Um, that will help these these athletes. Remember, a lot of them are not going to make it to the pros, right? So, you know, this this money might help them. You know, uh, they might it, it might be important to let them know. Listen, take some of this money and take a course, or you know, pay for a tutor so that you're able to finish school and your grades are good. Those types of things. So, 
I think that's an important aspect that I don't want to lose sight of, even though it's not legal. I do think it's important yeah. to the business in this space. Sounds good. And Greg? No, that, that's a great shout by by Andy. Um, you know, on, on the legal side, there are kind of nooks and crannies and, and little contingencies that should be understood. And, and that kind of goes for all the stakeholders we're talking about. You know, I, I was doing some work on an NIL deal where immigration came up. A lot of us think of uh, college sports as just an American pastime. The, there are 20,000 international students playing college sports. And, you know, where NIL law might not apply to them, you know, the, the requirements under their visa might. Uh, and they those might actually, you know, uh, counteract each other. Um, you know, disclosure and, and conflicts, uh, all the things we've discussed today. You know, just an understanding of, of where your state law is uh, on that and, and um, you know, having a good understanding of, of what the rules and and uh, potential conflicts of your college are as well. Um, those are all things that you don't want to lose sight of. And really, the only way to do it is to kind of go through this stuff with a fine tooth comb. That's right. And John, anything to add? Look, I, yeah, I, look, I, you know, for me, just watching this all unfold and having been on some other calls where I saw a real dichotomy, we haven't gone far enough. There's more that can happen here. There's more that can be unlocked for college student athletes versus, hey, we're losing the product. Is this the destruction of college sports as we know it? I, I think that's an unfolding, evolving story. And to me, I just I look at this and I say, is there a regulatory environment in place right now? Right now, I'm not really seeing it. Um, is anybody going to step up? Is, are any of these going to cross the line? I think some of our guests might be able to enlighten us a little bit more on whether there are certain deals that just are being nixed, whether at the school level or whether under some other regulatory level, and I'm not even sure all the state NIL laws provide for an enforcement mechanism uh, here. And whether that's good or bad, I think that remains to be seen uh, as to who takes on that role and whether Congress ultimately steps in here and creates a whole new regime that you know covers, covers uh, the college sports landscape. And I think that's an open question. Well, and John, and that's a great transition. Um, obviously, you know, with all of this, we're closer to the beginning than the end of the impact of Austin and state NIL laws on this landscape. And, but with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rick Caro to introduce himself and our some of our various stakeholders uh, in this area and our, and our special guest. So, uh, Rick, with that, please take it away. Byron, I'm going to jump in quickly before Rick and just deliver the CLE code um, quickly for those seeking CLE credit, and then Rick will will be sure to turn it back over to you. Um, so at this time, I'll announce the CLE code for those of you seeking CLE credit today. Please type the following code into the meeting chat feature on your screen. The CLE code is I Q zero eight K. Again, that is I as in ice. Q as in queen, the number zero, the number eight, and K as in kite. We will leave the box open briefly. One once more, the CLE code is IQ08K. And should you need it, the attorney affirmation form is also um, linked um, at the top of the, the meeting chat. Thank you. Over to you, Rick. Hey, Rick, one one quick thing before you start, if, if just a reminder, anyone who's not a presenter, if you could turn your camera off, that will make the presentation better for everyone else. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Byron, thank you. And uh, John and everybody, thank you all very much. Uh, as we get into kind of the practical application of an emerging and evolving field, I'm going to borrow from a friend, Tom D'Angelo of the Palm Beach Post, who wrote a really interesting perspective last week. And he said not to expect a commercial that shows DJ Ungalalele sitting on the bench as all of Fansville is in a funk over the state's offense, or Spencer Rattler handing the keys of his new 2021 Ram TRX to Caleb Williams, just as he had handed Williams the keys to the Oklahoma offense, uh, or Miami's De'Ara King and Bubba Bolden standing with arms in a sling as teammates fill a moving truck full of furniture uh, because if Dr. Pepper, Fowler Automotive Group or college hunks hauling junk wanted to give a true description of how it had gone for them since jumping into the deep end of the name, image and likeness game, these would be the spots we would see on ESPN or local television, much to the dismay of corporate America. You know, the NIL policy, as we've heard for the last 45 minutes, has been absolutely all over the place 
since being passed by the NCAA and others in July. Deals ranging from 30 bucks to more than a million. Deals paying for appearances or paying in product. And while most are low risk and have benefited both parties, others could cause brands to rethink their strategy in the future. And there's always a level of risk as far as all of these investments. All of these issues combined with younger, more immature, though gifted athletes that have their whole range of vulnerabilities and risks. And the bottom line is that the entire industry is left to figure it out. Well, we have some perspectives from industry leaders in the entire industry that may help figure this out. We have uh, Peter Mastro Stefano, the SVP and general counsel of Puma North America. Uh, he, along with his subsidiaries, Puma Canada and Cobra Golf, he's been in that role for, for merely 21 years. Uh, and for six of those 21 years, he worked as GC for Puma's then parent company, Kearing Americas, and owner of several luxury brands, including uh, Gucci and, and YSL. He has an extensive uh, experience in managing corporate legal departments in both the sports lifestyle and luxury space. We will then have Peter followed by Byung-Soo Kim. He was appointed senior vice president and general counsel for the University of Southern California in July 2020. He oversees all of the uh, legal affairs and directs the office <coughs> of general counsel, providing legal and strategic advice across all administrative functions, schools, departments, as well as the Keck Medicine School of USC. He joined uh, uh, USC after serving for almost six years as VP in the National Legal Department of Kaiser Permanente and certainly uh, significant and diverse, holding an undergraduate degree from Harvard and Master uh, of Science degree uh, from the London School of Economics and a law degree from uh, uh, the, my my school, Harvard Law School. Uh, Ron Slavin, the NFL agent uh, and Sports Stars Inc. Uh, founder. He graduated from Wisconsin Whitewater in 98, degree in public relations and marketing. Started working for a law firm who represented NFL players in March 99 and became a certified NFL agent in August 2004. Since then, represented over 100 NFL players and done over $500 million in contracts. He worked for the law firm from 99 to 2007, had his own company from 2007 to 18, and joined Superstar Sports Stars, excuse me, in 2018. Current clients include Leighton Van Der Esch, Quinn Ewers, who we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, Charles Leno, and the fantastic now Titan Adrian Peterson. Blake Lawrence, the co-founder and CEO of Open Doors, uh, the sports technology company that maximizes endorsement value for athletes. Former University of Nebraska football player, he launched the company with a vision to help a single teammate, friend, and NFL veteran, Prince Mukamara. And today, more than 70,000 athletes use Open Doors to build, protect, and monetize their brands with support from the world's leading companies and advertisers, partners, including the PGA Tour, NFL, PA, and BPA, Women's Player Association, LPGA, uh, Major League Baseball Player Association, and others, and over 100 college programs. Previously, he co-founded the social media agency Herdat, college football teammate, and now president of Open Doors. They later sold the market agency B2 Interactive, and as a former athlete, at the University of Nebraska, an MBA grad. He leverages his passion for sports and competitive nature to introduce new innovative marketing solutions as uh, to the athlete uh, endorsement industry. What you have with these four folks is industry leadership, uh, diversity, incredible perspective, and hopefully some candid conversation that'll follow. What I'd like to do is to introduce each individual sequentially have him give a couple of minutes about the industry, what he does, what his life was like before NAL, what his life is like now. Uh, and then I'll ask a few questions uh, in those five to six minutes. And then we'll open it up in the last 15 minutes of the program 
for questions across all four speakers. OK, all right, let's proceed. Peter, Senior Vice President, General Counsel of Puma North America, Mastro Stefano. I said that right twice. Am I good with that? Pretty good. I'm uh, I'm impressed, Rick. Thanks for having me. Go. Talk yeah, about so, the industry, um, talk about your business. Yeah, so basically um, the, the Puma brand obviously is a global sports lifestyle uh, brand. Uh, as uh, as you'd mentioned, I manage the legal department of Puma North America and our subsidiaries. Uh, I focus basically on IP uh, licensing, complex commercial transactions and the like. Uh, we have a, a group of attorneys here that uh, work on celebrity endorsement, also athlete endorsement. Um, I, I think this topic, the NAL topic, is, uh, is obviously very, very fluid right now. Um, we are dealing with it on a daily basis. Um, prior to this topic really sort of developing and, and the case law coming down, uh, we were really focusing on the pro athletes. And I think this um, this development has opened up a new marketplace and we're starting to see a lot of brands take advantage of that. Uh, you know, I think Puma being one of them. Um, and that has really changed how we look at endorsement deals. Um, granted, given the, the complexities now, we're looking at 50 state surveys, we're looking at not only uh, NCAA rules and regulations, we're looking at, you know, conference league uh, rules and regs, and we uh, will have to start working with schools to figure out really what's permissible with certain athletes as we move into this particular space. So you've had incredible vision. Uh, thank you for your perspective and your vision. Uh, you want to get into the space and create a splash. Along comes Mikey Williams, uh, one of the nation's top basketball prospects. On the heels of Puma's signing of him, your world has opened up. Well, first of all, talk about him a little bit and the process you went through to sign that kid. Yeah, I mean, we're really happy to, you know, have Mikey as part of the uh, family. I mean, he's a phenomenal athlete. And I think, you know, I'm not the guy that's responsible for making those decisions. You know, I, I have to uh, defer to our marketing guys and, and our basketball uh, division. But I think that, uh, yes, they did have some incredible uh, vision bringing him to the table. Uh, he's an incredible ambassador and I think he's going to work well. Uh, with the brand. He, he really does seem like a true partner. I mean, I can't talk about specifics of his particular contract, but, um, you know, we very much enjoyed bringing him on board and, you know, we look forward to see what he can accomplish uh, in the future. So if you can't talk about his specifics, can you talk about whether there's any part of his contract that hinges on whether he goes to college, G League, NBA or anywhere else? Yeah, I can't talk to his specific contract, but I'll talk in, in generalities just around sort of the NIL issue uh, and sort of contract drafting um, with any sort of endorsement contract and now more so with uh, with individuals in high school and, and now with this uh, new uh, new legislation uh, as this sort of opens up and we have new opportunities. Um, we just focus on building flexibility into deals. I think because the, the situation is very fluid, we're not sure where it's going to go. Um, you have to build in that flexibility. Uh, you have to build in uh, various guarantees. And, you know, these these deals really are partnerships. And if it's the right ambassador and he's coming in, he or her coming in uh, at the right time, um, then we will grow with that particular individual and ensure that there's uh, a, a mutual benefit. That's a great answer. I assume Mikey leads the way, but we're not going to get specific contract language out of you today. That's OK. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. No. A lot of people listening. But the template question uh, prevails, which is, you know, lawyers, uh, some confusion is a wonderful world for lawyers. Others, people are scared. This is a great opportunity to kind of define how NIL works in corporate America with emerging athletes. For example, morals clauses, we talked about it earlier, or injuries. 
Uh, we know professional athletes, that's the big issue today that corporations need to protect themselves. Same kind of issues or processes at your level relative to the Mikey Williams kinds of contracts, let's say. Yeah, I would say uh, absolutely. Um, yes, there are there are similarities there in in the drafting. I mean, of course, we're restricted. There's certainly no language uh, that would uh, lead anyone down the road of uh, of pay for for play. Uh, but at the same at the same time, it's it's an endorsement deal. Uh, in order for that endorsement uh, deal to have really a value, um, you know, obviously there are certain obligations, whether it's social media postings, uh, product testing, things of that nature, um, that stuff is there. And I think morals clauses certainly come into play. Uh, you know, the value is uh, his brand uh, combined with the Puma brand to really develop additional brand heat. And I guess my final question for you now, we'll return to you a little later. Uh, obviously, Dr. Pepper, Nike, Sam's Club. If I see one more of those Caesars commercials, I'm going to go crazy. But they're all over the place, and everybody is involved now. Uh, do you think that others will follow in a volume way or a selective way? I, I think, honestly, uh, brands are going to be selective in this space. I think they're going to look for um, ambassadors where they can really build an organic relationship uh, with. Um, it, it, it certainly will happen that uh, brands will bring in multiple ambassadors, but I, I think uh, at first, you know, with the fluidity in the law, I think uh, people are going to be selective until we actually get maybe some federal legislation or something along the lines where we get some additional clarity and it reduces the risk somewhat. Peter Mastro Stefano, uh, SVP General Counsel of Puma. We'll get back to you during the core questioning. Thank you for being such a visionary and entrepreneur in this space. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Byung Soo Kim, Senior Vice President, General Counsel, uh, USC. Uh, appreciate, Byung, you being here. And obviously also appreciate your choice of law schools. We're against the world sometimes, but, uh, you know, we have to define it as we go and move forward. Really appreciate you again and your world relative to where you are with NIL. Can you give us some overall perspective of where you are and where you're going? Uh, where are we and where are we going? Well, uh, obviously we've been following the legal developments in this area, uh, the Alston decision, which has, has already been discussed. Uh, and then uh, when the dam broke, we very quickly uh, realized that we needed to develop our own NIL policy. And this was during a point in time where in California, the California legislation, the Fair Play, Pay to Play Act, still was not uh, going to be taking effect until next year. Of course, we now know that that's, uh, the, the implementation date uh, was advanced. Um, but uh, what we wanted to do was make sure that our NL, NIL policy was reflecting a lot of different voices. Um, and so we actually took a step back and put together a, a campus-wide team. Uh, uh, and uh, I led a group with the director of athletics, Mike Bone, to, uh, and it included uh, folks, uh, st students, it included faculty members, it included um, members of the athletics departments, of course, uh, members of our athletic compliance office. And we all got together and talked through a, a lot of these issues. We were also looking at what other schools in our conference were doing in terms of their NIL policies. And because a lot of these policies are, are available online. And we, we worked through the issues. and. The NIL policy is, is going to continue to evolve, um, but, uh, you know, it's that was really our focus several months ago, um, and it really kind of laid the foundation for how we're going to deal with issues around marks, how we're going to deal with uh, 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 coach involvement in, in deals, how we're going to deal with institutional support, how we're going to deal with morals clauses, which you were just mentioning. Um, the, the California uh, law 
it isn't just a blank slate, I should emphasize. You know, it does say uh, in California that uh, you know, athletes have to inform the schools about their deals, uh, that they can't conflict with those deals. And so we've developed some processes around uh, using an influencer app uh, to make sure that uh, we're aware of deals before they happen and can provide uh, approval. Um, and we've been really trying to provide a lot of education because I think um, we're concerned about students um, being taken advantage of, not understanding uh, that there are a number of NCAA regs and rules that still apply and um, that could you know, effectively uh, end their careers if they violate them inadvertently. So we've been really focused on uh, developing our policy but also educating our student athletes so that they can be smart as they navigate this world. Tell us a little bit about your Altius partnership. How did it come about and what was the rationale for that partnership? Uh, I don't know exactly how it came about, but uh, they have been very helpful to us in terms of putting together a training uh, and education around NIL for our student athletes. And again, because that's been such a focus of ours, um, e even more, um, initially than, you know, trying to, you know, facilitate deals or, you know, figure out what level of institutional support uh, was right for us. Uh, Altius was really a, a good for us because they are just really focused on uh, education and training. And, you know, our aspiration at USC is to have the most student athlete focused uh, program that we can have. And so that was really important and they were helpful. So SC was involved in one of the original wage hour cases being brought by college athletes, uh, Lamar uh, Dawson. He lost both uh, at the district and the Ninth Circuit level. I suspect we do know SC's position on whether college athletes are or should be employees, but the fight on this front, mostly for collective bargaining, raises issues that seem worth uh, addressing, especially around health and safety, medical, disability insurance, and the like. And now that students are free to make money? Are there other improvements that schools could reasonably secure for athletes? And if so, are there fairness issues between schools or even between programs within a school? Yeah, so that's definitely a compound question, but I'll, I'll try to break it down and, and answer in pieces. Yeah, uh, we were involved uh, several years ago uh, in the Dawson case, which um, you know held that uh, Yes, student athletes are not employees. We now have the NLRB general counsel a memorandum, which of course, you know, we're looking at that memo is, is not legally binding. And, um, but we're aware of, um, uh, you know, developments in that space. And, and I think we're in, we're in pretty good, uh, we're in a pretty good position. I think uh, we've, we invest a tremendous amount around uh, safety and, and, and health, particularly uh, coming out of the pandemic, uh, you know, your second, the second part of your question is really uh, important because uh, I think that so many people, when they hear about NAL, they just think of football, yeah. maybe a couple other sports, and and what's really important, not just for us, but I think for for all, all universities are looking into this, is how do we. Um, just putting completely aside, you know, the legal, uh, you know, implications of Title IX, just more fundamentally, how do we, uh, how do we uh, create equitable opportunities for athletes, uh, male and female, across all of our athletic programs? That's really important to us. And, and the training that I mentioned was, was very much, um, uh, uh, you know, broad in that sense. It was it was tailored to all athletes, and frankly, I think that some of the things that were, uh, some of the business opportunities here, could even be extended outside of athletics uh, completely. So, so that's interesting as well. Byung Soo Kim, that's words to live by. Really important perspective. We'll be back to you in the when the floor opens up. Ronald Ronald Slavin, uh, Sports Stars Entity Inc. NFL agent extraordinaire, uh, many contracts, uh, many clients, many relationships. Ron, how are you? What's the business like? I'm sure you don't get to sleep these days, but talk a little bit about your life. Um, I appreciate you having me on. I am a 
been an agent now for 23 years. Representing NFL players has changed a lot over the years, considering when I first got into the business, cell phones were just a thing. And now we literally live on our cell phones because if you don't answer a text or a phone call, you feel like you're going to get terminated. Um, so it's just a different world. Social media has changed a lot too with players and their Instagram and Twitter and, and how many followers they have, you know, it's sort of how they see their worth, which is a lot different than when I started and, and we're still reading the newspaper when, you know, players were making plays, you had to read newspaper articles about them where everything's online now. Um, so the way the NIL, the, it hasn't changed much for me because I didn't think I was going to get into it, but the relationship that I had with Quinn Ewer's family, um, because we live in the same town, it kind of happened organically is how we got involved with Quinn. And then, and Quinn's also, Quinn's like Mikey Williams. They're, they're kind of unicorns. There aren't guys with their talent and, and kind of the notoriety that they had at such a young age. So th what, what they got in NIL versus what the reality of what most of these players are getting isn't really even close. Yeah, and, and obviously the unicorn issue as far as setting a precedent uh, is critically important. The idea of you working so faithfully and skillfully in that space for so many years, and now you're handed a whole substantive area within that space that you never contemplated, contemplated it, but you couldn't do anything about it before. How's that changed your life, your business life, your agency life? It's going to, it'll change over time here because other agents are going to use the NIL to actually try to just recruit players. So they'll bring in marketing guarantees and offer these to college players where if you offered money to college players in the past, you get, you know, it's against the rules, you can get suspended. The states have different regulations, states can come after you, where now there's going to be guys out there that are going to offer these marketing guarantees to college kids, whether they're going to get $100,000 in NIL or not, if they guarantee that money that's the way they're going to use it to recruit. So that's going to be how it changes um, for what I'm dealing with. But the way that we do it at Sports Stars is we, we try to stay at the schools that we already have relationships, compliance who we deal with. Um, so we're going to keep getting the same type of players and same type of kids. The thing with the NIL that scares me a little bit is when we're signing these guys for the NFL draft, 20, 21, 22 years old, they still have so much to learn and they're handed all this money. And now we're talking about 16, 17, 18 year old kids getting that type of money. Are they gonna continue to work and do the things they need to do to get to the next level? Are they gonna be content with just getting the money based off how many followers they have on Instagram? And is that gonna ruin a lot of these kids the way it does as rookies and second year players um, versus you know, kids coming out of high school? All right, so my final question to you now before the floor opens. If that scared you a little bit, how about the high school kid who's 15, 16, and he wants a little bit of the fruit from this tree? And how do you keep him motivated? How do you navigate the high school regulatory requirements? How do you chase away the bad actors? Uh, that is a quintessential compound question, but I guess how do you deal with all those challenges is the better way to ask it. You better hope that the athlete has a really good support group around them the parents, the, the mentors, the coaches, whoever they have around them, you need really good people. I mean, it's no different than a lot of these guys that go broke in the NFL. They just don't have good people around them. So when you're going after people, if you, have, if you are lucky enough to get a Quinn Ewers, he comes from a great family, has great people around him, comes from a great town here in Texas because we, we live in the same city. Um, but they, you better hope they have good people around them because there's going to be a lot of bad endings. Well, Ron Slavin is good people. Really appreciate your perspective on all of this from the agent side. We'll catch you in a couple of minutes. So Open Doors was founded in 2013. It was six years before any NIL law was on the books. In addition to a soothsayer, I want him to be uh, Blake Lawrence to be my real estate agent, my stockbroker, all the stuff that predicts the future. Blake, how you doing? And talk about how you parlayed this vision into where you are today. Well, I appreciate it, Rick, and I appreciate the comments so far on on this world of name, image, and likeness. And there is so much happening in our world of, at Open Doors. I mean, we provide technology to the athlete endorsement industry. 
Uh, we started the company to really help one athlete back in 2012 and, and quickly turned into partners with the major professional sports organizations, players associations at the pro level. And what I spend a lot of time on is, is working with college athletic d- directors and department leaders talking about this world of name, image, and likeness. And the first thing I say is that name, image, and likeness monetization is new to college sports, but it's not new to sports, right? If you look at Ron, Ron and his team at Sports Stars have been uh, working their tails off for a long time to help athletes monetize their name, image, and likeness, and it's been reserved for pro athletes. So there's not a lot of recreating the wheel. It's just uh, reinforming or, or introducing for the first time the concept of NIL monetization to the college world. Uh, so the technology components that we provide are really helping athletes just run their NIL business, right? So helping athletes get pitched from businesses or brands or fans that want to pay them, handle contracts, sign contracts, remind them to show up for appearances, remind them to post on social media, request proof of their uh, performance. So there's quid pro quo, auto disclose things to the compliance office, handle payments into their bank account, actually handle the process of getting them to fill out W-9s and 1099s. I mean, there's so much that um, an athlete needs when they're running in their NIL business. And as a technology provider in the last decade, we've just evolved to help the growing needs of today's athletes. So I guess we could call you an encyclopedia for the development of the NIL business, but 98% of the people out there don't know what an encyclopedia is anymore. So we'll have to figure out what the next step and what we call you. The last seven years since you've opened has must have been a tremendous evolution. I'm sure you've pivoted a number of times. You're still way out ahead of the pack. Um, what, what was the kind of inspiring vision and, and how, how did you make all the necessary pivots? You know, for us, uh, you know, my story, Rick, I played football at Nebraska uh, back in 2009. We we're the number one defense in the country as a starting linebacker. And uh, midway through my junior year, I found out I could never play football again. I had suffered four concussions in a little over a year and, and decided to step away. And I dedicated my whole professional career to helping athletes understand this doesn't last forever, right? That you can build tools and use technology to make the most of your time as an athlete. And so for us, we really just put the athlete in the middle and say, what do they need, right? So the very first solution was back in 2012 when Buddy in the NFL needed help understanding whatever his tweets were. People wanted to pay him to tweet. He had no idea what to charge, right? And so we built an entire you know system to help predict the value of an NIL activity for an athlete. And then you get into a world like athletes needed a process of like quickly signing an agreement. You know, uh, one of, some of my teammates had never used a fax machine and don't know how to print things. Right. So they needed to have one click contracts. And then um, there's an entire world of Venmo payments like athletes literally didn't know how to to cash a check. So once you put the athlete in the middle, you just start to realize that can we solve one more problem for the athlete, get them to have a little bit more success in a little less time. And that's that's really how we've evolved. And um, now this there's about 5000 pro athletes, Rick, in North America that move the needle in athlete endorsements. There's 500,000 student athletes in North America that now have entered the market the first time. It's just 100 times bigger, um, and the problems are about 100 times bigger as well. So it's been quite fun to navigate. Have you, in terms of your own personal navigation and evolution, Blake, uh, 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 when in the last seven years did you reach kind of the epiphany point where you realized you were ahead of the game, you had the right perspective in mind, and you were able to influence policy not just process how easy it was for athletes or make it easier for them to navigate but you could actually help influence the direction of where this is going yeah certainly i would say in in july 2019 by that time open doors we had you know secured partnerships and were providing technology to the nflpa mlbpa nbpa nhlpa pj tour all that and um got a letter in the mail from the ncaa uh asking to join their federal and state legislation working group to understand how technology is going to play a role in the administration of the name image and likeness market and at that point rick i I went over to audi canal my business partner and i i I had printed off the paper slapped it against the window and i said i think we made it right and and in that point just to be invited to uh, provide guidance and how technology is going to impact the nil industry um at the highest level right with the ncaa that was kind of a a, a proud moment for me and, and to see that two years of work rick uh into having structure in the nil policies and procedures to go out the window as, as we talked about earlier and one fell swoop on june 30th of this year um quite a roller coaster 
Uh, my final important question for you before we open it up. Uh, that is the most well-behaved cat I've ever seen in my life. He's either bored or sleeping. Yeah, that, right, that, that side. Uh, does he participate in NHL profits with your company, or is he on his own? <laughs> he is a, he's a celebrity in his own right. You know, animals have NIL rights these days, and they, they yeah. can make some money online. So this cat has quite a following on Instagram. What a surprise. What a shocker. Blake, Blake thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let's let's open it up a, a little bit, and, and let me just start randomly by asking Peter again. Uh, pre Alston, was it hard to plan for NIL and, and opportunities uh, from your perspective? And you know, where 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 is it all going? Um, kind of today and in the future, wild wild west. When did you see it coming? You know, how did you start staffing up or intellectualizing it up for that? And and, uh, you know, has that helped you going forward? Yeah, I mean, we've been watching it for a long time, uh, just uh, being a brand in, in the business that uh, that we're in. I mean, pre Alston, you know, we focused on on the pros. It was just uh, a lot easier. You know, the you you had the, the bright line uh, sort of uh rules and regulations as far as what you can and uh and and could do and um you know i think when austin came about it just it just opened uh, everything up um and it made sense from our perspective i mean we do a lot of celebrity uh endorsement work as well and we felt that um it did make sense i mean we're we're negotiating with celebrities all the time uh they're monetizing their nil uh, and we, we felt it was really a natural progression for athletes to be able to do the same thing. I think the problem that we have now is that it really is a web of complex legislation. Um, nobody really knows where it's going to go. Um, these athlete endorsement agreements are usually a lot longer than just one year. So trying to forecast what's going to happen in this new market and ensure that you remain compliant and still get some benefit uh, for the bargain is is difficult. You know, I think, you know, we all hope for federal legislation on the topic. I don't think it's really around the corner. So it seems like we're going to have to live with this, you know, this complex structure of, of regulation. And I think it means that, you know, we're going to be talking a lot more to universities um, and constantly conducting 50 state surveys and trying to get a handle uh, on on what's necessary from a compliance standpoint. Well, and I guess hey, Rick, good... Rick, yeah, Rick, oh. I, I want to jump in here because I'll take liberty as the co-chair of the, the Foley Sports and Entertainment Group. I, I had look, I, I talked about enforcement issues and and I keep wondering whether there is a line that anyone can cross. We look at these NIL collectives and Blake, you brought something up, um, you know, in our pre pre-call here. And I'm wondering, are, are schools saying no uh, to any, any NIL deals out there, no matter where they come from, whether it's just social media or these collectives or group licensing arrangements and things that look like they're close to the line? Is there anything happening out there that someone's saying, hey, no, we're not doing these deals? And if they are, we, on, on what basis are, is there a no? Yeah, certainly. So one of the things that any advertiser or, or business in this industry has to navigate are these school by school NIL policies, which are informed by state by state NIL policies. And in certain states where there is a state law in effect that specifically provides the institution the ability to limit the types of activities that athletes can um, participate in, you know, in those states, the, their compliance office feels strongly about their you know ability to say this is a competing sponsor with our official apparel sponsor. So we're going to uh, reject the opportunity to, you know, have this athlete engage in activity. Um, but in other states where there's no state law and they simply have a school policy that's really not backed by any legal precedent, like that opens some interesting things for the the legal team here. Uh, you know, we've seen athletes that uh, were provided a significant earning opportunity from a legitimate national, multinational or global um, apparel and footwear brand that was denied simply because it was in competition with their school's official apparel provider and there's no state law in effect so they're simply just restricting the uh nil earning potential of a student athlete on the basis of a policy that has no legal backing but simply the backing of the institution itself so it's an interesting 
um, predicament to see those things that could turn in litigation happening just in the first few months. John, if I can kind of follow up on that too and ask uh, uh, Beyond uh, and, and then maybe Ron from your perspective, it is wild west, wild, wild west, non-regulated. And where do we think the next bit of overwhelming regulation could be or would be? It can't be, we're not waiting for, for federal regulation. We're looking at the states that are doing it. You all are trying to influence the states in some context, but you know, two, three, four years from now, who is the who is the 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 dominant uh, controlling uh, entity in this space? I, I think the answer has got to be uh, the Congress, um, and there has to be some federal legislation. And I don't think anyone sees that immediately on the horizon, but that is, I think, what what needs to happen. Whether it does happen, what form it takes, I think is anyone's guess. I, you know, you hear the phrase Wild West a lot, and I, I understand the feeling. Um, at the same time, you know, as uh, you know, the last speaker was just mentioning, schools have NIL policies, and they're trying to be very intentional about aligning those policies with their institutional values. Um, and, you know, I, I saw, so I, I, and I think that there are going to be more interesting uh, kind of arrangements uh, that you're going to see as 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 schools start to kind of explore what kind of institutional support you know they might be interested in providing in order to be student athlete centered and stay competitive and so you know uh, it certainly felt like the wild west when uh before california had law went into effect and and after the nca uh suspended its rules but you know i think actually that um, you're starting to see some markers being placed down. So, Ron, did you want to comment? I think the schools are going to use it as a recruiting tool, actually. I think the bigger schools, the Alabamas, Oklahomas, Ohio State, Clemson, they're going to, Georgia, I know, is already telling kids there that they're going to have more opportunities for them than a Mac school. Or Not that they're going to recruit against those people, but when they're recruiting against each other, it's going to be, Hey, you're going to George, Alabama, and, and Nick Saban's telling everyone his quarterback's making seven figures, and now it's Georgia's quarterback. How much is he making? And that's that's where it's going to come. And, it, and I think it's going to be across the board, all positions. But then when they're trying to get the big quarterback, it's really going to be, hey, well, how much did your quarterback make last year? Hey, John, you know what I'd like to suggest since we're you know clearly almost out of time from my perspective. Uh, let, let me let me uh, ask uh, all four of you to take like a minute and just uh, kind of summarize where you think we're headed. What's the biggest challenge you think we're, we face and what does the landscape look like two years from now? I know it's the, the classic compound question, but, you know, take any one of those pieces you want and uh, just uh, give us some closing thoughts. Uh, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see some litigation in this area for for sure. I mean, as schools. Um, build training programs as they build policies and procedures around this particular uh, area, I think that that will protect them. But I think, you know, we someone had mentioned Title IX, you know, it's really how those schools uh, enforce those policies and do they do it in a, unif in a uniform fashion uh, so they can survive sort of a statistical discriminatory attack. You know, for sure, if if things stay the way they do, I, I think um, there's a lot of money on the line. And, you know, for those schools that uh, reject those uh, NIL opportunities, uh, you're, you're going to see some pushback. Beyond? Yeah, I, I, I agree that um, we're going to see more and more recruiting uh, uh, pressure being placed on schools, and that's going to uh, spur some creativity and innovation. You know, with respect to um, rejecting deals, you know, I guess I look at it a little bit more positively. I don't think really when I think of NIL about, you know, just, you know, rejecting deals that conflict and we have that requirement under California law, but I'm focused more on how do we create opportunities for all of our student athletes. And I think one of the interesting things we're going to get is just a lot more data on what kind of deals uh, are being struck, what kind of compensation uh, is being made. And I think that we're, we've all been a little bit surprised maybe by how little the average has been in terms of, uh, you know, what kind of deals are being struck by athletes. 
Rod? Um, I think there's going to, you know, in your opening statement, you talked about the quarterbacks that they probably haven't got their monies out of it because one was benched, the other one's not playing well. I think there'll be some pullback with some of these bigger deals and maybe see where these kids are at before they start throwing money at certain positions and then maybe the smaller deals across the board for, um, you know, like in Miami where they're doing it for the whole roster and to put 500 or a thousand bucks extra a month in each of these kids' pockets with some NIL deals, I think that might be something that we'll see more of and the bigger deals for quarterbacks will be until they kind of substantiate themselves. Um, Quinn got the deals that he got because he was talked about on the national media. He went to some camps, threw the ball like Patrick Mahomes. He worked out with Mahomes. There's pictures of him and Mahomes out there. So that's how it kind of blew up. And then with Texas not allowing him to make the money his senior year, when we had these deals coming to him, he left and has signed for $3 million now. Blake, you, Open Doors, and your cat get final word. Certainly. So I, I, we are a data-driven and, and a technology business, right? So we are in a position where tens of thousands of student athletes across the country use our technology to facilitate and like handle the payments, uh, handle the disclosures. And so we're privy to a lot of data. And what you'll, you're talking about here is, is so far in the first four months of NIL, the, if a student athlete has made one dollar, right? If they've if leaned in at all, they, they've averaged six hundred and seventy seven dollars, right? On the high end, you've got the Quinn Ewers that are in the seven figures and the low end, you've got athletes that have made uh, uh, 20 bucks, right? And it's all relative. But everyone on this call that went to college, uh, you know, that feeling of being on campus and having an extra 20 bucks in your pocket, it is significant. Uh, this is going to be a billion dollar a year industry. If you add up the compensation to student athletes, as well as the technology and industry that pops up around this and licensing and and sponsorship and, and uh, representation. Um, Five percent of all D1 student athletes have already surpassed six hundred dollars in NIL earnings, uh, which means that there's a lot of, of education needed to explain to a student athlete what income taxes are, what W-9s are, what 1099s are. I mean, there is so much happening in the space that not everyone has Ron. Right. Like, thank goodness that Quinn Ewers has you, Ron, because there are 50 other guys on his team that have no representation that have earned enough that they're going to have to disclose these transactions, uh, facilitate and get the 1099s done. Um, one more thing on this, just in terms of equity, guys, in the top 50 earners in, across the country in our data set, uh, 10 of them are from women's sports. Right. So only 10 out of, of the top 50 earners are in women's sports. But. If you look at the most active, like who are who have uh, performed the most NIL activities, uh, 28 of the top 50 are from women's sports. So you're looking at a world where female student athletes are participating at a higher clip in the NIL um, industry than male student athletes or those from women's versus men's sports. Um, men's sports are simply getting compensated more on a per activity basis. That compensation likely is tied to the fact that donors are major contributors to the NIL compensation world right now, and they are picking athletes based on the sport they play at the school they attend, not uh, their actual NIL value. So you gave me a minute. I took two and uh, hopefully you learned a thing or two during it. No, but your two minutes was twice as much perspective and stuff we hadn't covered, too. So, Blake, thank you. Thanks all of you for your just incredible, diverse and invaluable and thoughtful perspectives. The one thing that I will take away from this is that while some, some people will continue to say it's the Wild West, it is evolving. It will be a billion dollar industry and the industry is in really good hands because of the thoughtful leadership of you four and others. Really appreciate your time. Back over to John. Look, I, I know we're over, and uh, I, I do want to thank everybody for attending. Um, I want to thank our guests for for their, you know, incredible insights and firsthand experiences. And, of course, I want to thank my colleagues, too, and our support who put on the entire program. Look, I, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of disparate views. Uh, not Wild West. Is it the Wild West? I don't know. I mean... I look at this and I sometimes it reminds me of when gambling uh, world, the gambling world changed after the, the Murphy case of the Supreme Court. Uh, DraftKings and FanDuel sort of blitzed the, the market with their uh, advertising 
uh, for the fantasy games. And it became, you know, it became accepted. And I, and I feel like this has a similar feel. There's a lot going into this environment. Um, there doesn't appear to be a lot of regulation at the moment. Uh, there may not be incentives to say no to some of these, uh, you know, arrangements in ways that um, as they get closer to pay for play, I think the litigation perspectives that everybody offered, um, you know, are going to be out there. And this is going to just be, as we say, a developing uh, uh, landscape. And we'll probably be back at it again, my guess, Rick, uh, at some point um, to sort of revisit in another, you know, six months just to see, you know, maybe even sooner, uh, given given the rapid pace of change. But in the meantime, again, thanks all for attending. Get your CLE credit and uh, appreciate uh, everybody's input and involvement here today. And I think we're signing off. Everybody uh, have a great day. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. guys. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Have a great day.